I just want to know where she is. And now I've come to where I don't have any more leads myself. Where do I go now? Now what do I do? That was Lisa Hyde, mother of missing person Kara Hyde. 23-year-old Kara has been missing for nine months at this point, and as you heard from her mother, she doesn't know what to do next. We need your help. We need to get more eyes, ears, and hearts open and looking for Kara. Let's do it together. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Kara Hyde. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. And this is one that is getting some decent local coverage, but outside of that, it's just not getting that next level of exposure. Nothing really in terms of YouTube coverage that I can find. There was one podcast that kind of got in there with some early coverage. Um, thankfully they did because there was a couple of questions I had we're gonna be able to answer thanks to their information but just not a whole lot looking in this direction. And why? It's another one of these situations where we have a young person that might be struggling with addiction issues. And for some reason, it seems like people just don't want to open themselves to this case. But I know better than that with this audience. Let's go ahead and start learning about this, starting with where it takes place. That is Hamilton, Ohio. Hamilton is a city in and the county seat of Butler County, Ohio. It's located 20 miles north of Cincinnati. It's the second largest city in the greater Cincinnati area and the 10th largest city in Ohio. Population is just over 63,000 as of the 2020 census. And here are some photos from Kara's Instagram. And these seem to be a little bit older. Uh, these might be uh, maybe some brighter days. Her mother has explained to the podcast that we're going to be leaning on for information that Kara uh, really through her teen years seemed to be doing pretty well, seemed to be proud of the fact that she hadn't fallen into some of the other things that other, her peers had. Um, she really apparently wasn't a big fan of people that were using drugs. However, later in life that would seem to shift and, uh, they would certainly become a part of her life. But, uh, we have one more collage here. I just want to get a bunch of images. Of course, we're scrolling images down below. We're going to do that through the whole episode as well. Uh, you can see that she does change her hair color from time to time. So we've got a good mix of those images going here. Uh, I went looking for information on Facebook. Surprisingly, I'm hearing that she's a big social media user. And of course, we do have the Instagram. But uh, for some reason, I can't find a Facebook account that I can see is like her current account. I believe her mother might have um, taken over one of her accounts. And I've seen other family members do this. Um, as part of their personal investigation, they want to get access to their missing persons, their missing loved ones, Facebook information. I get that. But then starting to use it to repost about that person, about their missing persons case, I really don't suggest it because the Facebook, it, it can wind up being an investigative tool. And effectively with how she has kind of taken over one of Kara's accounts, and I, I don't know that it was the most recent one. I've actually reached out to her. I've asked a bunch of questions. That was one of them. Just I can't find the one that was the most recent. Kara did have several. Uh, I found two of them here, and we can see uh, this first one, uh, Kara Lauren 3. And then I did find another one, Kara Lauren Quinzel. Uh, and I'm seeing some references. I think she might have been a little fan of uh, Harley Quinn from the Batman series. but there's just not a lot of information that I'm finding in these. And the one that her mother has taken over, I kind of scrolled back to the previous years. There's just nothing there. There's no friends list. So I feel like I'm missing the active one. Um, I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I just, I couldn't find it. Basically the, the one warning or kind of lesson I would put out there is just that that could possibly be an investigative tool. Might not be good to actually use that one. It's really easy to just go ahead and create your own Facebook account and not have to do that and potentially, you know, I, I'm not saying it's harmed the investigation or anything like that. Hopefully law enforcement saw everything that they needed from there. They've already got it cataloged. And then her mother went ahead and started using it after that. But, uh, and like I said, I do see this happen. Let's get over to NamUs and get through the basics of this case. Kara L. Hyde, and of course, from the Facebook profiles, 
Looks like her middle name is Lauren. A white Caucasian, date of last contact, December 5th, 2021, missing from Hamilton, Ohio. At the age of 23, she is still 23 years old. Standing at 5 feet 8 inches tall, they do have her noted as weighing around 120 pounds here. For the circumstances of the disappearance, the missing person, Kara L. Hyde, was last seen leaving a house on Grand Boulevard in Hamilton, Ohio. That house is where she was living with her mother. Uh, that happened on December 5th, 2021 at approximately 1.30 p.m. She's leaving in the middle of the day. Lots of opportunity to be spotted there. She's walking by cameras. Probably a good chance that those are going to pick her up. Kara has not been seen or heard from since this time. Uh, it is noting some additional details, but I'm going to save those for the article once we get there. But they've found no signs of her other than an item that is found in some woods nearby. We'll get to that. For hair color, they're saying strawberry blonde eye color, brown, really no other description here, no description of clothing, which is kind of strange because it seems like she was speaking to her mother when she left. I don't know how we don't have a clothing description. Uh, no other distinctive physical features. There actually are other physical features. She has tattoos. We're going to jump ahead to Cincinnati.com. According to her mother, Kara is five foot six, so a little shorter than the name is profile and weighs about a hundred pounds. Uh, they're saying that she's lighter and smaller here. She has multiple tattoos, including a skull and a snake on her right forearm and a girl crawling out of a well with the word Stephen on her left forearm. On her left thigh, she also has tattoos of a garter belt and the word loser with the S crossed out and replaced with a letter V. Um, I don't know why we can't get this stuff updated at NamUs. I might just send them a little email and let them know. At least let's get the tattoo information in there. Uh, and I should, if I get contact going with their mother, uh, I'll certainly ask about the clothing description and see if we can get that added there as well. So it was her mother's home that she went missing from uh, here at the kind of the corner of Grand Boulevard and Parkamo. And we see around here, there is a convenience store in this area. There is an auto wash. There's another business over here. So some potential for cameras to pick her up. From what I understand, she's traveling on foot at, at the time that she leaves her mother's house. There's nothing noted, and I haven't run into any information about any potential vehicle being part of this. So this is largely a kind of a residential neighborhood, just with a couple businesses in the middle of it. We've got a local church nearby. Um, but then we do have these woods over here, what's known as Crawford Woods. And it's not kind of the wooded area. You know, when you look at this without the satellite view on, you're like, oh, it's a big chunk of, of wilderness there. Not exactly. We can see there's a lot of it's open and there's several baseball diamonds. Um, there is some kind of thick wooded areas on the perimeter of all that. But I'm just going to tell you guys, this area has been searched and uh, they haven't found her yet. So I'm not sure of, of this as other than maybe it was a location that she was known to frequent. Maybe it was some place she would go to and meet up with people. That's certainly a possibility, but um, I'm not sure what information is really causing that to be such a, a strong draw in this investigation. Maybe we'll find it as we go forward. Continuing at fox19.com with some more comments from her mother. Quote, I don't know what to do. I need help. I need my baby. Really, anything could have happened to her, and anybody could have done it, and we may never find out, Lisa said. Right now, I don't care. I just want to know where she is. Lisa describes Kara as a drop-dead gorgeous, smart, artistic, creative, and funny person, but her many talents, Lisa says, has been overshadowed by intermittent substance abuse. I've been trying to help her. I've had her in rehab three times, Lisa said. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to this podcast and thank them for putting together a great episode on this. I wasn't familiar with them before this status pending. They did a case overview on Kara's case. Uh, and thankfully they spoke to her mother directly and got some information kind of about the family makeup and things like that. Kara is actually the youngest of six. It looks like she's got three half brothers, two additional half sisters. Her mother describes her as the queen of the family. Her mother says that she was kind of spoiled growing up. She's known to get very emotional, but her mother also noted that she was very giving. She's someone that would really reach out to help other people. As a matter of fact, we're going to hear from another of her friends that kind of supports that as well. Continuing at journalnews.com, Hyde was reported missing by her mother, Lisa, 
on December 18th. Now, I know we look at that time frame very often in these cases, particularly when you have someone goes missing and it's their significant other that's the person to report them. And sometimes when there's a gap like that, it makes us think twice about the possibility that that significant other could be involved here. Uh, Lisa did get some flack for that on a conversation thread that was happening over at Tapa Talk, and she responded to that. So let's go ahead and hear what she says about that time gap. And also keep in mind, uh, this might not be an abnormal occurrence. Her daughter kind of disappearing, not coming home that night. Her daughter's 23 years old. You know, we're not talking about a 15 or a 16 year old here. And there's a pattern that has been developed that, that her mother has noticed before. Sometimes she would disappear, but back to the comments from Lisa. I am also reeling from some comments that were made about me on a true crime website, misinformation that needs to be addressed. A comment was about how long it took me to report Kara missing. I've covered this already, but I'll do it again. I had three life and death situations going on at the same time. I had just been informed I needed life-saving surgery ASAP, which involved invasive testing the week Kara went missing. My mom was rushed to the hospital on the 5th, that's the same day, in critical condition. I was at the hospital for six days with her, dealing with doctors. As POA, power as basically she has the power of attorney for her mother, I ended up placing my mom in hospice care. The whole time I was contacting Kara's friends to find her. When I informed Kara's dad about Kara, he said he would go file a missing person report. He did not. As soon as I found out I made the report, that comment hurt me deeply. Um, so obviously a lot going on in her life. I'm also curious just to know about the time frame. You know, if Kara's last seen at 1.30 that same day, her mother's in critical condition. I've kind of heard two different stories on how Kara went missing. We'll get back to that soon, but first some comments from someone working on the case, Sergeant Rich Burkhardt. He said detectives are asking for help from anyone who may have seen her or heard from her. Lisa said she believes her daughter, who struggled with drug addiction, may have placed herself in danger. She said the family has been searching on their own. Quote, she's gone missing a couple times before, but never this long. She lived on Facebook. Nothing has been posted and her phone just goes to voicemail. A couple of good things there. First of all, uh, knowing that she has a phone, there should be some level of tracing there. If it's not GPS, at least cell phone triangulation and should also give us a little bit more of a time frame in terms of how active was she after she left the home at 1.30 on that afternoon. I can tell you guys, unfortunately, I can't find any information on that. Um, I know that those are factors. I'm sure investigators are looking at them. That information for some reason is not public. It's one of the questions that I put to her mother. Unfortunately, I have not heard back from her yet. I'm kind of keeping my fingers crossed that I might hear from her before I'm done recording here today. But if not, I'll keep you guys updated on the channel uh, if I do hear back from her. And then of course, also just re-raises the question about if she lived on Facebook, I'm just, I don't know why I can't find that account. Maybe it's been hidden for some reason. Maybe that's part of the investigation. Maybe they're they're keeping that account wrapped up for some reason. Over at WCPO.com, missing Hamilton woman's bag of clothes found in woods. Detectives took to social media last week asking for information about the woman's whereabouts. Her mother, Lisa Hyde, pleaded for someone to come forward. Sergeant Rich Burkhart said no new information has been received. Burkhart said a thorough search was conducted on Saturday by Equisearch Midwest and police in Crawford Woods, but nothing was found. So outside of that, that I don't think it's an extremely, it, there's areas of it that might be challenging, certainly. Uh, I can see that it's, it's dense in some pieces, but it's not super large. Um, what's more concerning to me is that there's pockets of this type of foliage that just continue throughout here. I mean, this looks like a very dense area. This is another dense area out here. Um, but if you look just around all these neighborhoods, I mean, there's just pockets and pockets of this stuff. So being concerned that she might wind up somewhere around there uh, in this size pocket, I, I would just, I'd be just as equally concerned about these other ones. But we know at Crawford Woods, reportedly, the family does find a bag of her clothing there. Now, that was one of the questions I'd put uh, in my message to her mother, but thankfully the podcast did ask those questions as well. And they came up with some information about it saying that essentially this was a bag that was packed for Kara for one of her trips to rehab. It was a bag that she hadn't used in about a year. 
It was found under like a plastic tarp in the woods around Crawford. And it, it kind of looks like, I guess it was a homeless person's camp where this was found. So I don't know if, is it something that Kara gave to them? Uh, being that it was under some type of plastic like that, I think it'd be hard to evaluate how long it was out there on the podcast. They said it wasn't particularly dirty, but if it was under a plastic tarp that could have protected it from the elements. Uh, but it's clothing that effectively was packed for her a year before sounds like she probably didn't use, maybe didn't care about potentially, maybe she gave it to someone. Maybe she just associated that whole pack with part of that memory of rehab and she didn't want it around and she just got rid of it, gave it to, to a homeless person, something like that. Quite a bit different than, you know, her purse was found something that we know that she would be carrying daily. And also different than my initial worries, which were, well, wait a minute, because the story we're hearing from the mother is kind of like, it was my birthday. She was going out to retrieve the present that she had made for me and she was going to be right back. Well, then why would she have a bag of clothing? How did that leave the house? But to me, it sounds like it's pretty reasonable that that bag was left out there a while before this. Um, that other story, let's hear it directly from her mother about what happened in the final moments that she saw her daughter. My birthday was the day before. And she told me she made me a present. She said, it's a little box. I think you'll like it. Um, I'm going to go get it. I'll be right back. I love you. And that was the last she said. And that's pretty much the story that I've seen her mother repeat in several different interviews and across several different articles. Then we get to the story that I'm seeing here on this missing persons poster. Kara was last known to be in the area of Grand Boulevard. Same, same. She visited her mother, then left to visit some friends. Kara has not been seen since. Now, could it be that those two things are the same? Possibly. Maybe where these friends were is where this box that she made for her mother was kept. So two kind of minor variations on the story about her disappearance. If there is friends involved, of course, identifying who those friends are and then picking up the trail from there. Did she ever get there? If she did, where did she go from there? Uh, is certainly very important with the investigation. Over at fox19.com, reward offered. We hear about the first of some rewards that are offered for this. Lisa believes a 23-year-old may be held against her will, hence the urgency to find her. Another option is tied to Kara's history of substance abuse. I feel that Kara may have possibly OD'd, and if she was with someone, they may be afraid to say anything, Lisa said. This is a very common fear for families that are dealing with missing loved ones that have substance abuse issues, and I don't know how you shake that. Of course, it's something you're going to be afraid of. And now that you're looking back at this nine months later, like that's not a consideration you can ever take out of play. And that's something they're having to deal with on a minute to minute basis. Police are offering $500 to anyone who has information in Kara's disappearance. I'm a little surprised. I don't think I've ever seen a reward amount kind of that low. Um, but they're going to address that uh, in the near future here. Kara's family says they're offering a thousand dollars. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen anything offered like that unless it was like a historical case I was looking at that kind of used to be the amount that they would kick out initially. Um, but not for anything modern. And like I said, they, they do address it. Uh, several events are held. Basically her mom just continues to work in terms of Facebook work. There's a pretty active Facebook group about this as well that she contributes to regularly. Uh, she's doing as many local interviews as she can. And then there's also events that are put together, a few particular events that happen in these first few months. Events to raise awareness of Hamilton woman missing for two months. Lisa Hyde said, there are plenty of rumors about what happened to her daughter who struggled with drug addiction but no sightings and her social media has gone silent. A honk for Kara event is planned outside Butler County Historic Courthouse on High Street. I want to make sure people see Kara's face, she said. We're having it downtown to make HPD and everyone else know she is still out there. Lisa Hyde said she's been frustrated with the Hamilton police investigation. I just do not feel they are as invested in this as I would like them to be, she said. You know, we're talking two months into this. We see this pattern 
almost 100% of the time in these missing persons cases, families will get frustrated somewhere between one and two months into it because the efforts kind of slow down and they're just left with all these questions. And sometimes it's hard to even get phone calls back from the investigators working it. In this particular case, the investigator that's currently assigned to it, I feel like we're in good hands. We're going to get into that in a moment here. When police were asked about specifics in the search and if the reward resulted in any leads, the response was the investigation is continuing. Now, why do I think Kara's case in particular is in good hands? Because of the detective that I'm seeing that's currently assigned to it. Uh, his name is Brian Wynn. He was promoted to detective, I believe, around 2019 but he got some accolades for something kind of important. This article is actually talking about it. Uh, June 1st, 2018, when Hamilton police officer Brian Wynn first started accompanying Jennifer Mason of Fort Hamilton Hospital to meet with drug addicts, trying to connect them with rehabilitation, the pair often heard deadlocks clack shut. Sometimes people ran out their back doors, fearing arrest. These days, Wynn is just as likely to receive a hug from those he visits. So this is a guy that effectively became part of a program to do outreach to addicts and to try to offer them services. And I mean, I'm sure most of us can imagine, yeah, you know, you're going to an addict's house, knocking on their front door, you're going to hear the deadbolt go, you're going to see some of them fly out the back door. But then there's the ones that you connect with and actually make a change in. And it seems like that happened here. Wynn recently won a pair of awards for his work helping drug addicts to help to get them help disconnecting from heroin and other opioids. The Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Regional Council of Governments presented him with its award for outstanding public service, and the city of Hamilton commended him for his innovation with the program. I think if we are talking about her um, being a drug user and that circle being a part of her going missing in some way, if she did go to a friend's house, if there was some type of use that happened there, if it is that big fear that her mother has about the possibility that she OD'd, uh, if there's something else, she went to meet up with a dealer she wasn't familiar with, things went sideways. It seems to me that someone that has done this particular type of work, and I don't, I can't remember a case where I've seen something like this before. I think detect now detective Brian Wynn would have some good inroads with that community uh, because of his work with them over previous years and maybe might be able to get some inside line on some of those angles and what's going on with that. Back to the article. In the past seven months, he's contacted about 200 people, no small feat considering that many don't have permanent addresses or phones. Hamilton people can reach him and then they give out his phone number. Uh, I believe, yeah, it's actually the same phone number we have on the screen right now. He follows up on overdose reports just as a detective would, and then he visits the addicts. Quote, it may be the next week, it may be just the day after, and we provide them with the resources they can make contact with if they're willing to get treatment. Sometimes people are willing, sometimes they aren't. It depends on where they're at in their life, he said. The article goes on to talk about that, you know, he might reach out to 10 people. If he gets one of those people interested in the services, it's certainly worth it. And I'm sure that it might even be steeper than that. You might reach out to a lot more people, but just saving one life certainly sounds worth it to me. I really love this program. I, I hope that we see more of this in different areas. I think it's a really great idea. I like that they were cooperating. They were kind of working with the, with the hospital, getting their services out there and just reaching directly out to people, kind of using the records that they had. Oh, we've got an overdose report. Let's go do a door knock here. Let's let them know about the services that are available to them to help them. Um, sounds like a really cool thing. Now he's a detective, so I don't know if he's doing this work exactly. Maybe he continues this in his spare time. I can't imagine he has much, but uh, hopefully someone else is picking up that program and kind of rolling forward with it. Back to the investigation, according to Hamilton Police Detective Brian Wynn, investigators have followed up on several leads, specifically some related to Hyde's last actions on social media. Just to be perfectly honest with you guys, that comment in particular is why I wanted to find this account. And maybe that's why I can't, um, especially with him calling it out like that. It could be that they pulled all the information and then they wiped the account. Uh, it could be that 
even though her mother took over one of her accounts, that that's not the one that was her most recent and most active. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards. But it seems like there's something in that communication that turned into leads for him. However, so far, they can't determine whether there was any foul play in her disappearance. We really don't know what happened or where she might have went from there, he said. That sounds interesting because it sounds like they've kind of identified at least where she was going to. We have went through numerous areas of evidence and things that are provided to us that we can look into. Detective Wynn said there are people who are not cooperating or speaking with investigators. Now, I don't know. I don't think he'd be talking about that in a general sense. This is a guy that's used to that. Just remember what his job was just a few years prior. This guy is doing door knocks. Um, and I don't think that was the scope of all his work. It's one of the things that he did, but he was doing door knocks and people were closing up their doors and running out the back. He's probably used to that response in general. This for this to come out in this article, I think he's talking about very specific people that he's got particular reasons to talk to particular people and they are not cooperating with the investigation, which does throw this into a whole different category. And Unfortunately, it kind of makes those fears that her mother has even worse, that there's some type of, you know, possibly a, a drug connection here, possibly an overdose situation, something like that. They're reluctant to want to be a snitch or anything like that. We're hoping people will come forward that may have known Kara that are reluctant to talk to us, he said. That has prompted Hamilton police to raise their reward for information in Hyde's case to 2,500. So significant reward increase. That's on top of the thousand that the family's still offering. So there is a combined reward available at this time, from what I can see, of $3,500 for information that leads to where Kara is. Now, along with the police investigation, the family's efforts are still going. There's searches that are going on. There's other events. Here we are learning about an event at a bar to support efforts to find missing Hamilton woman, Kara Hyde. Gemini's Bar on Harmon Road in Hamilton has partnered with Ohio Valley Missing Persons Organization with assistance in advertisements created with the help of Fully Loaded Dance Studio to spread awareness about Hyde's disappearance. The benefit included a raffle, a bake sale, a silent auction, barbecue, shakes, and uh, basically it was provided by a restaurant called Smoke and Dews, and a percentage of the proceeds went back to help the search efforts. According to Andalyn Beddington, marketing and promotions director for the bar, donations will go towards resources to help the search. Quote, I thought it would be a really great opportunity to see the community come together. And it really has. People from all over came forward to help. It's been amazing, honestly, to see how much the community cares. Sergeant Rich Burkhart said a thorough search was conducted in January by EquiSearch Midwest. We've talked about that. We know they searched Crawford Woods. They didn't find anything. Uh, for some reason, they went back to that area. The same area was searched again. And they're saying over this past weekend, this is now February of 2022, but nothing was found. At the bar fundraiser, the hashtag Kara About Me was seen plastered on the walls. Lisa Hyde read a heartfelt letter pleading with anyone to come forward with answers. She expressed the fears that cloud her mind. Yet others, like close friend Carly Spawn, find hope in knowing Kara was loved by everyone. Quote, she was one of those people you could call and be like, I'm in a situation and I have a problem, and she would be there. She's worth so much more than whatever she's put herself through, like so much more. Kara has battled addiction in the past, and her loved ones hope that others can see beyond her struggles and understand their heartache. I really love how that's phrased. It's something we try to highlight on this channel all the time. Um, there's a lot of people that are impacted when a person goes missing and it's about helping them as well. I think a lot of us have this thing where we want to just disassociate from the story because it's, it's hurtful to think about the possibility of, oh my God, my daughter's missing. And if there's some way to write that off easily based on some notions that we have personally, oh, it's a drug addict. I don't have to care about this that's not quite true because there's other people that are being affected by this that maybe aren't drug addicts. Quite honestly, I think we still need to care about the drug addict as well. But I'm just saying that kind of simple belief system of just don't care doesn't make a lot of sense when you understand the scope and how deeply into the community these disappearances can reach. 
Speaking with Kara's aunt, Susan Smith, the Hydes did not have much family support over the years and says a community support means everything. If I could see her again, I would grab her and not let her go, Smith said. So as I mentioned, this family is not giving up. Here at WCPO.com, Kara Hyde's mother said she will never give up the search. It's really starting to look bad, she said. There's been a lot of people who have gone missing since then, and they've all been found, just not Kara. Unfortunately, that's the nature of missing persons cases. Vast majority of them, the people either come back or are found, but there's these other ones that go on they get outside that first few weeks. And unfortunately, we look at different types of situations. And obviously, Kara's case is one of those. Lisa is keeping her daughter's name out there by hosting events, vigils, passing out flyers, and constantly posting on Facebook. I can tell you, she's going through all the same stuff we've heard in other cases that is still mind-boggling, terrible to these families. I don't understand how they happen. We've got scams. We've got people reaching out. I know where she is. Uh, you know, Give me money. I'll tell you where she went. Um, they put up flyers, go back the next day, the flyers have been removed, all these things that we hear time and time again in these cases. Quote, I don't understand why anyone would want to hurt her, but it's kind of looking like that might be the case, said her mother. And the efforts continue. We know that they did the bar fundraiser in February. In April, we have another search. Volunteers gathered at a wooded area in Hamilton. Kara's mom, Lisa Hyde, says she's thankful for the continued support. She got the most recent search location from a tip. Quote, the tip came in, which led us to a location to search today. She said, we're going to try to find my baby. She says that she's leaning on tips and information from friends who were close to Kara, holding on to the hope that they'll find her. The alternative, Lisa says, is something that she isn't willing to accept. I can't stand the thought that I might not see her again, says Lisa. On top of that, in May, we have another search effort. Uh, this talks about the fact that the family found a bag of her clothes in Crawford Woods. Now, new tips are leading the family to about a mile away from that area. One of the tips involved actually seeing her at this site on or about the night that she went missing, says Lisa. That's got me hopeful that, you know, we might be going in the right direction in this search. So a mile away from the area where we know her clothing was found. But like I said, I, I can't put a lot of stock in the fact that her clothing was found there because it was a bag from a year before. Um, I went looking just kind of a mile away from here. And unfortunately, there's so many pockets of these wooded areas. I, I, there's no hope in terms of identifying where they were. Um, just within a mo one mile radius, I'm seeing easily half a dozen areas that that could be. And I think maybe that's not a terrible approach. Like even if you don't have a tip coming in about a particular area, I'd almost make a map of this area and start just doing it like a grid search. Like, you know, one of these areas every weekend, just go out and kind of do my own search. Even if you can only get yourself and a few people together, um, I think that's that's the best way to go about this. I mean, we don't have any information to really suggest that she was taken away from this area. Um, we do also have a river that's running through this area, the Great Miami River. That might be another area where I would try to get some searches going. We get to June 2022, same thing. A group of searchers met outside Jay's Furniture Sunday morning and then drove to the search location. Gets harder every day, her mother said. Every day she's gone, I miss her more and I need to find her. There's urgency that I have to find her. She was a force. She was very animated, very outgoing, enthusiastic, sweet, artistic, creative, kind. She had a heart of gold, Lisa said. And of course, you're noticing she is talking about her in the past tense. I think that Lisa, Lisa's hope kind of broke pretty early on in this case, and I think she is fearing the worst. She added to keep the search parties going, she needs more volunteers. Been looking everywhere for volunteer searches because with the weather breaking and the case being so old, I'm losing quite a bit of searchers, she said. Lisa is doing everything she can to find her daughter. She's still creating and hanging flyers. She's visiting places Kara has been to. She's talking with people Kara knew. She's turning Kara's car into a mobile billboard. Now, there's a little interesting fact in itself. Apparently, Kara does have a car. I just, I'm trying to understand the mechanics of her leaving. Did someone come pick her up? Did she tell her mother, oh, someone's coming to pick me up? Like, that could be really important information to kind of get out 
um, well, at least get to the investigators. You know, it can be kind of tricky trying to make that information public unless that person turns into a person of interest officially, which we don't have anyone named like that in this case. We heard from the investigation. They're basically saying we don't know that there is any foul play situation that's happened here. And quite honestly, there's still a possibility that there isn't. I mean, we have other indicators going on in here. If she was struggling with drug abuse of some kind, she might have opted to get away from her family to not subject them to possibly what she was going through herself. So there is a possibility she's out there. There's a possibility that she's keeping away from the family intentionally. Back to the comment, her mother believes Kara will be found by either investigators or volunteer searchers. If we are talking about the worst situation here, there's also a very strong possibility that she will be found um, by someone that is doing some type of recreational activity, walking a dog, searching for mushrooms. Those are ones that are very common. They come up a lot in terms of people being found. Um, I don't think those woods, we're not talking about hunters getting through there, but you know, people maybe that ride off-road bikes. That might be another angle on this. Reach out to those communities. If there's any local groups, maybe on Facebook of, you know, off-road bikers for that particular area, maybe make sure that they're aware of her. Get a poster out, get the information out. Another critical thing, I mean, there's just, there's pieces about when she left that I think are really important to get out to the public. Number one, clothing description. Number two, where she was going, if it's possible to release that. When she was expected to return, I think that's really just understanding the mechanics of, of her leaving. What was that really about? Unfortunately, that's all the media that's available on this case at this time. And unfortunately, I did not get a response from her mother yet. I'm hoping to hear back. If I do, we will certainly do an update video on all that. But if you want to join, uh, find Kara Hyde on Facebook, if you live close to this area or you just want to support them, please do that. Of course, I have a link in the description box down below. But more importantly, if you have information about what's going on with this case, we've had the number on the screen the whole time. I hope that you have seen the heartbreak that her mother's going through, knowing that she has so many siblings, also wondering where she is. There's a lot of people in a lot of pain with this. And I hope you can find it in your heart to pick up the phone, place that phone call, and uh, I'm telling you, the detective that you're getting in contact with seems like a good person, at least from, from what I can tell on, in terms of the articles we found on this guy. And uh, I don't know, I, I would just want to help this family if I was in your shoes. And I, I hope that you find that place in your heart to do that. There is, of course, also a web sleuths thread for this case. I'll have a link to that down below as well. I looked at the tap -a talk link. I wasn't super put off by the way that they were talking there, but Web Sleuths is hev heavily moderated uh, in what I consider a, a positive manner so that you're really focused on the conversation about what's going on with the case, raising the questions that are important about the case, but also, um, you know, they're pretty good about not slighting people. Like there were some comments about her mother and her mother taking too much attention or focus away from the case and things like that, that just, I don't know that that's particularly helpful uh, to the case. So Web Sleuths, kind of a great place where if you're looking for very focused conversation on these cases, ways that you could really contribute and help or other resources, even just to see other people contributing and helping in significant ways, Web Sleuths is, is the place to do that. I want to give a very big thank you to everyone that keeps us supported here at the Lord and Arts channel. That's all of you. Patreon subscribers, PayPal supporters. If you want to become one of them, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Candy Bishop recently did. We really appreciate your support as we try to help these families in these very tough situations and also share these stories that maybe help other families avoid these situations or give them ideas and tips in terms of handling them if they do wind up with a missing loved one themselves. And as always for Searchlight videos, we have a link in the description box down below to my missing persons tips I've put together over several years, a bunch of insight from the best sources I could find and directly from families that have faced this themselves. So please use that link if you ever need it. Thank you so much for being here today. We'll see you again on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel.